Thanks for joining me today. Um, as Ashley said, this is Organizing Your Course in Blackboard Learn. Again, I'm Matt Acevedo, and I will be your guide today. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm an instructional designer with FLU Online, the Distance Learning Division of Florida International University, a public research institution in sunny Miami, Florida. I have a Master of Arts in Instructional Design and Technology and a graduate certificate in Instructional Design for Simulation. I'm also a Blackboard Catalyst Exemplary uh, Award winner, probably due to a clerical error, uh, but I'm not going to question that. Uh, in a past life, I did teach a few subjects at the high school level, and I do also teach a course at FIU. So I'm still touching, uh, I'm still in touch with those of you on the front lines. But most importantly, I'm a big Doctor Who fan. Uh, any Whovians out there, uh, give me a smiley face or a check mark. Is there any uh, Doctor Who fans out there? Okay, I see, I see one, two. Okay, okay, I'll take that. If you're not into Doctor Who, you gotta go check out your Netflix and uh, watch some Doctor Who. Anyways, the Doctor Who joke's coming up. It's my hope that after this webinar, you'll go from this doctor confused and slightly worried to this one, knows what he's doing. So, again, apologies for the Dr. Who joke. Who is this webinar for? Well, the idea is that you'll have some Blackboard experience, but would still consider yourself a novice. Maybe you've taught before or used Blackboard to assist with a face-to-face -face course, and now you're teaching online. Or maybe you're just a beginner looking for some additional guidance. This webinar should work for you. Who is this webinar not for? Well, if you're a pro at Blackboard or would consider yourself a power user, you probably won't get much out of it. Or on the other side of the spectrum, if you're totally and completely new to Blackboard, like you've never logged in and this would be your first exposure, there are probably some better places for you to start than here, like ondemand.blackboard.com. Also, if you're a Dalek, this webinar is definitely not for you. That's another Doctor Who joke, and I'm sorry, it's my last one. I, I promise, no more after that. Goals of today's webinar. When you're done here, you should be able to create an online course from scratch that is intuitive for students to navigate, saves the instructor, the instructor and or course designer as much time and headache as possible, is compatible and gets you set up for the Quality Matters review process in the Blackboard Exemplary course program, is aesthetically pleasing, it looks nice when you're in the course, and it complies with accessibility standards. I'm also going to throw a few pointers your way, some do's and don'ts when it comes to common things you'll encounter in Blackboard. A word about applicability. I'm going to throw out the phrase content agnosticism, meaning that what I'm going to talk about today is completely independent of and can apply to your subject matter and your content. It can apply to whatever instructional strategy or methodology you choose to employ. So if you're using a constructivist strategy or a more guided method, the tips I'll show you today should apply regardless. Similarly, it doesn't matter how big your audience is. If you have a class of five or 500, everything I'll talk about today will still apply. And lastly, you can use these tips whether you're teaching in a fully online format, uh, a hybrid or mixed mode format, or a web-assisted format. And some disclaimers before we get started. Um, first off, the screenshots you'll see are from my university's Blackboard instance, which is running Blackboard Learn 9.1, Service Pack 13. If you're on a different service pack, things may look a teensy bit different, but everything still really applies. Next is disclaimer. I work in higher education, and you might too, or maybe you work in K-12, or maybe you work in corporate training. I, re I tried really hard to make things a excuse me, applicable across disciplines, but no one knows your situation and your context better than you. In a similar vein, I probably don't know anything at all about your subject area. There may be things that you need or want to adapt if you want to try out some of this stuff, and that's awesome. The best possible scenario here is that you take a few things from here and make them your own. So now that all that is out of the way, we can dive in. To show my examples today, I'm going to use a totally fake hypothetical course, PBJ 101, Foundations of Peanut Butter and Jelly Sandwiches. Why peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Well, it's not just to be silly. It's an example I use a lot. Uh, when we're working with something easy like PB&J that everyone can relate to, it takes the subject matter content out of the equation so we can focus on organization and presentation. If I were doing the same thing today with a course on thermonuclear astrophysics, I'd probably alienate a bunch of people, myself included. Plus, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are delicious, 
so why not? My course will be made up of four weekly modules. In this webinar, I'm going to use the word module a lot. Module doesn't mean anything other than an organized container of course content. Module, unit, strand, maybe chapter, week if your content is organized weekly. All of these things mean the same thing. I'm going to stick with module, but these terms are completely interchangeable and you should use what you like most. For my peanut butter and jelly sandwich course, this is what I have offline going in. I'll have a course syllabus, my learning objectives at both the course and module levels, a brief introductory narrative text block for each module, a list of what I want students to do, an idea of some resources and activities, some icons that I'm going to use with my student directions, and a picture that relates to each module. And here's my game plan that I'll walk you through. I'm going to start with a totally empty course shell on Blackboard. No content, no tools, nothing in the course menu, nothing in the file manager. The first thing I'll create is a course homepage and a welcome item. Along the way, I'll upload some files that I need. Then I'll create a module template that has all my goodies and my structure. And last, I'll copy and adapt my template for the other modules in my course. A good way to think of this is like a blank canvas. I'm starting with nothing, and I'm going to slowly create something that works for me. Remind you of anybody? All right, just like Bob Ross. Okay, let's get started. Here's my totally empty course that my system admins were kind enough to create for me. I've removed literally everything. My left-hand course menu is empty, and there are, as you can see, there are no available items in this course. My file manager for this course is totally empty, too. That way you know I'm not cheating. I've removed everything. The first thing I'll do is create a home area. I'm going to hit the plus over the course menu, making sure I have edit mode on, and choose content area. I'm going to call it home and make it available to students. And just like that, I have my first bit of content. The first thing I want to do to this area is add a welcome item. The purpose of a welcome item is to introduce my students to me, assuming that I'm the instructor of my peanut butter and jelly sandwich course, introduce them to the class, and give them some guidance as to what to do next. Just like in a face-to-face -face course, it's important to use a friendly conversational tone without being overly casual. My students know that I'm a nice guy, but they also know that I'm not their bro or their homeboy. Um, avoid being really formal or robotic, which can actually detract from the learning environment. You can read more about the research into how a conversational tone actually may have learning benefits over a formal tone in books like uh, E-Learning and the Science of Instruction, which is a great book by Richard Mayer with Clark uh, that I really recommend. So here's my, my welcome item, which I have created in my area um, by clicking Build Content and Choosing Items. I've given it a simple title, and in the text, I've introduced myself and discussed some, basis, some basics of what to expect from the class. I have a sentence that, that says, you'll want to read the syllabus. Let's turn that into a link to the syllabus itself. I'm going to highlight the phrase, read the syllabus, and click the Insert File button. In the screen that comes up, I've uploaded a PDF of my syllabus. Make sure the text box labeled name of link to file has the phrase read the syllabus in there because uh, even though it was highlighted before, Blackboard is going to change it to the file name. Click submit and it's good to go. Um, this is probably a good time to take it aside and talk about accessible links in your course. When creating hyperlinks, do use the title or description of the destination content as your link text. Don't use click here or the URL. URL itself as the link text. For someone who is using a screen reader and is navigating through the links on a page, click here is meaningless. Um, similarly, www.youtube.com slash watch question mark Z equals Z3 Z A D B, etc. is meaningless. In my welcome text, click here to read the syllabus is no good. So here's some other examples. Click here is bad. Using the URL itself is bad. Using the destination content title as your link, as you see on the right side, is just right. Cool, moving on. The only thing I want to add to my welcome item that I haven't added already is a picture of me. As much as I don't really want to stare at myself whenever I open the course, 
it does help students make a personal connection to you so that they know there's a human being behind the blackboard. First, I'm going to land my cursor in the very front of the text box, right before my first word. Click there and make sure you have the blinking cursor. That's the picture on the top left here. Next, I'll hit the Insert Image button, Upload My Picture. Remember to give the picture uh, an image description. Again, this is for screen readers, and I'll talk about this a little more later. The title, contrary to popular opinion, which is the, um, the box below image description, doesn't actually do anything for accessibility. It just gives you the little pop-up tip when you hover your mouse, and I don't need that for this picture. Under the, the Appearance tab, I'm going to choose Left Alignment, which will keep my photo to the left and wrap the text around it. I'm going to put 10 pixels of vertical and horizontal space around the picture, which makes the surrounding text not look quite so close to the photo. I'm also going to give it a one pixel border, which adds a nice touch to almost every image. Remember this 10, 10, 1 for the space and the border because I'm actually going to use it later. I hit submit, and there we go. I've got a nice item in my welcome area. The next thing I want to do is sculpt my course menu, which for me starts with a discussion of what tools are going to be used in the course. My peanut butter and jelly sandwich course, I decided, is going to use announcements, course messages, the discussion board, journals, assignments, tests, and of course, the My Grades tool. Like I said, choosing my tools is the first step for me for picking the items on the course menu. This is my philosophy for the course menu. Less is more. It's very zen. I prefer to reserve my course menu for tools that will actually be used by students, plus high priority content like the syllabus. This is an example of a course menu that I'm not a fan of. It's so long that I have to tear it in two. The more things in this list, the quicker students are going to get lost. It's unlikely that we'll want both course messages and the email tool in this course. All of these weekly modules or units can be consolidated into one area, which would save a ton of real estate on this menu. We also don't want to use the space for arbitrary links, like these links to the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, which I have seen in live courses. Those websites aren't hard to find, and if they're that helpful, that's what browser bookmarks are for. This is a much simpler and cleaner course menu, and this is the one I'll use in my PB and J course. It's short enough to, pre to be pretty much self-organizing, so I don't even really need subheaders. The two dividers are enough to imply the divisions between content, like the home page and the syllabus, tools, and important external resources like tech support and university policies. Let's take a little bit closer look at my menu to see how I've added these things. Announcements, messages, the discussion board, journals, and my grades are all tool links. That I've, hit, that I've added by hitting the Add Menu button, which is the plus, and choosing Tool Link. Easy enough. My syllabus, technical support, and university policies are web links. Tech support and policies are external pages hosted by my institution, obviously, but why is my syllabus a web link? Well, a few minutes ago, I uploaded it from my welcome item into the home area. I don't want to upload it again, and I don't need an entire content area for it. So to make this link, I've copied the link location from that link in the welcome item, right-click, copy link location in Firefox. In Chrome, it's right-copy, copy a link address. Then I paste that as my web link, and it points to the same, page, same place. Easy peasy. Home, assignments, and quizzes are content areas. Home, of course, is the first area I created when I started. Assignments and quizzes are going to be content areas because I'm planning on consolidating all of the assignments and quizzes in these two respective areas. I'll come back to this in a few minutes, but for now, just know that those are content areas. Now let's take a step back and see everything so far. It doesn't look too bad, right? It's clean and clear, and I think I'm off to a good start. But I don't have anywhere to put my actual content yet. My next task is going to create a module template, a blank shell that I can reuse and fill with my content. This starts with a discussion about what's going to be common to every week in the course, every module in the course. Since I'm going by weeks, 
what am I going to do every or almost every week? In my PBJ course, I'm going to start off each module with a short introductory narrative text, and I'm going to list all my learning objectives. I'm going to include a picture that either clarifies or illustrates that module's content, mostly for aesthetic purposes. My students will have a textbook reading in each module. Yes, I have a textbook for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Students will participate in the discussion activity. They'll do a quiz to check for understanding. They'll complete an assignment, and they'll make a journal entry. Kind of a lot of work for a, a course on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, I know. Back in my home area, I'm going to create a new content folder. You can see that the name of my folder is Module X Module Title. This isn't me being extreme or edgy. I'm just using X as a placeholder. In the text area, I've got a note that dates go here. When I populate this template with content, I'm going to put the dates of the module here, which has some pros and cons. The pros of using dates in text are that it looks nice and it helps organize your course. Students don't have to keep referring back to the syllabus to check dates. The con is that you have to update this every semester or term, which is kind of a pain. For this course, I think the pros outweigh the cons, so I'm going with it, but do what suits your context the best. Now that I've submitted my content folder and I've entered it, it's empty, of course. The first item I want in this and every folder is my introduction text. That's going to be build content and then item. And here I am. I've given the name, I've given the item the name introduction and I've just thrown in some starter text to fill later. Easy. In this item I also want to drop in my module picture or at this point just a placeholder for that picture. I'm very particular with how I do this because I want it to be A, clean, and B, consistent across modules. First, I'm going to click my mouse right before the first word so that my cursor is the first thing there. That's the arrow you see on the left. Then I'll hit the add slash insert image button, which is the arrow on the right. So this is going to drop my image as the, the first thing there. On the screen it appears when you hit the Add Image button, um, I've uploaded my image from my computer, which is the gray placeholder you see on the left side. On the Appearance tab, I've chosen Alignment Right, a width of 300, and the 10 pixel spacing and one pixel border that I had in my welcome photo. So right alignment, 300 pixel width, 10 pixel spacing, and a one pixel border. I'm going to keep these settings for every module's picture. We'll come back to this. But for now, let's see how that looks in the template. It's not too bad. It's a little bland for now, but that's okay. The next item I'm going to include will contain my learning objectives. For each module of the course, I'm going to list the course level objectives addressed in that module, plus that module's own objectives. The idea here is that each individual module has learning objectives, and those objectives relate to the broader course objectives. This is a big part of the quality matters program, if that's something you're considering. I'm going to have everything that applies listed in each module. But for the template, I'm going to insert all of the course level objectives and an empty bulleted list for the module objectives. Maybe you have an idea of where I'm going with this, but if not, I promise this will make soon. Make sense soon. Um, this is going to help later when I'm copying my template. So let's take a look at what this item actually looks like. The name of this item is Learning Objectives. I've listed all of the course objectives plus an empty bulleted list for the module objectives. I also missed an apostrophe, which I'm seeing now, and that pains my soul a little bit. Anyway, the, the subheadings are spruced up with bold and underlined, which makes it look nice. This is all I want for now. So I hit Submit, and there we go. Still bland, but we're getting somewhere. My next item will be the student instructions. This is when you start to get into the fun stuff. Well, it, it's all fun, but this has more color. Before I add a new item for instructions, I'm going to pop into my file manager for the course. Depending on your institution, this will either be content collection or files, but for these purposes, it won't matter at all. 
In my file manager, I'm going to create a new folder by hitting the Create Folder button, and I'm going to call it Icons. Inside that folder, I'm going to upload, you guessed it, icons. These icons, to be exact. Each one corresponds to a student activity, and I'm going to use these in my instructions item in each module. There's one for a textbook reading, one for reading some kind of other document that's not the textbook, a play icon for playing a video or other presentation, a check mark for any kind of test, a mouse pointer for external links, a notepad for assignments and journals, and speech bubbles for discussion board activities. All of my icons are 20 pixels wide and 24 pixels tall so that they're consistent and it'll look nice on the instructions list. I'm more than happy to share these icons with anyone and everybody. My email address will be up at the end of the presentation. If you want to use these icons, uh, they're public domain, just shoot me a message and I'll send you a zip file containing all of them. Let's jump back to the module template. I've created a new item called directions. The first thing in the text area is going to be a numbered list. Um, I don't have it circled here, but there is a numbered list button, which is better to use than just typing in the numbers. Right after the number one, I'm going to hit the insert edit image button. I'm going to browse through the course to find the first icon that I'm going to use, which will be the textbook. Since you already uploaded these to your file manager, you'll be able to find them with the course. Remember to put it in the image description. Very important, and again, I'll talk about that later. Um, Submit the image, and now we have this. Right after the image, I've given students the first instruction with X marking the chapter number placeholder. This red arrow is pointing to a space that I've inserted right before the word read, which gives it a little space between the image and the sentence. What I'm going to do now is repeat this a few times, once for each of the things I want my students to do every week. And now I have this. That looks nice. The consistent size of the icons spaces out the lines just a little bit. And these icons give students a quick visual glance at what's to come when they first enter the module. Now that we have our student directions, it's now time to actually send them to their content. And I'll be primarily using course links. Course links are your friend. Course links take you from one point in your course to another which is helpful when we want to have the tool-based content in our course in convenient and consolidated areas. For example, the next item in my module template is going to be a course link to the discussion board area. Clicking this link is equivalent to clicking discussion board in the course menu, but by having the course link in the content area, we have everything presented literally for the students as well. So this course link points to the discussion board with an instruction to proceed to the discussion board to complete this module's discussion activity. Note how generic I'm being. I won't have to change this course link in any module. As long as I have a discussion activity, this course link can stay as it is in my module. Same exact thing with journals. This is the next thing I'm adding to my template. I determined earlier that every module will have a journal, and this is one way that students can get there. And again, I won't have to change this link for each module. And again, same thing for the assignments and quizzes content areas, areas. Which brings us to the topic of consolidated areas for all of the assignments and another for all of the quizzes or other assessments that use the test tool. Why do this? Well, I'm glad you asked because that's the next slide. Well, one big reason is that those course links stay the same within each module, just like they did for the discussion board and the journal. Also, these content areas give me the chance to give directions and other info to students that apply to every assignment or every test. For example, a list of due dates or a listing of preferred upload format for assignments. I can have this information once in each area instead of repeating myself in each module. Another reason is that students can navigate directly to those areas. If I'm Jimmy Student and I set aside a time for myself to take a quiz and open up my course, click on the quizzes area and I'm there. No need to navigate into any modules or subfolders. And one more thing, if you delete a content folder with assignments, with assignments in it, you've lost those assignments. Yikes. If you have them in another area, then they're safe. So what does this look like in practice? This is my assignments area. 
Again, I can get here from the assignments link in the course menu or from the course link in my module, which links to the content area and not to the assignment itself. I've given the students the due dates for all the assignments so that they can check here instead of rereading my 10-page syllabus. I have directions for how to upload assignments, and I have a note about our tech support contacts, as well as when, as well as when system maintenance is performed so that students know not to try to submit during that time. Below, I'll add my assignments later when I'm ready. The quizzes area looks very similar, but has due dates and information for my tests. Since we're just Talking course organization in this webinar, I'm not going to cover how to create assignments or tests, but know that this is where those pieces will be deployed rather than within the module folders themselves. And with those last few course links, my module template, my empty skeleton is done. Let's take a look. Not too bad. It's empty, but it has potential. And now the fun really begins. I know I already said that, but this time I mean it. Now that my template is done, I'm going to copy it. In the home area, I'll hit the drop down next to my module template folder and choose copy. The, de the destination area will be that same home area. And just like that, I have two module exits. Now it's time to fill in the blanks. I'm going to edit the folder and change one of the templates to my first peanut butter and jelly sandwich module, which is module one, choosing your ingredients. I've also added my date. This is a spring semester class, as you can see, so I'm doing this well in advance. Uh, next, I'll go into the module one folder and start making my edits in there. This is my introduction item. I've replaced the placeholder text with my introductory narrative. I had this offline in Notepad, so it was a cinch, a cinch to drop in. I also want to update the image. Don't delete the placeholder image. Click on it and hit the Edit Image button. That way, some of our settings are preserved. OK, I'm editing the image. I've uploaded a new image to replace it, and I've given it a description. In the Appearance tab, the only thing that I need to update is the dimensions. I have to put that back at 300. My vertical and horizontal space is 10, and my one pixel border will stay there because I'm just editing that placeholder image. So that's great. Um, a word to the wise, make sure your raw images are an appropriate resolution. Don't use a super high 15 megapixel picture and shrink it down to 300 pixels here, because the browser is still going to load that large file. This raw picture that I started with was roughly 350 or 400 pixels wide, which is fine. All right, I'm getting somewhere. That's a nice introduction piece. It sets up the module and tells students what to expect, and it's visually appealing as well. Since we're set up for an image in each module, now is probably a good time to discuss some do's and don'ts for working with these types of images in your course content. Do use good clarifying or illustrative images, like high quality photographs or other high end graphics. Don't use cheesy Microsoft Office 1990s style clip art like those below, which I flat out reject. Rejected. Do maintain image proportions. Don't squeeze or squish images. This is a common beginner mistake. People will often try to shape an image to fit the space it's in, but they do so without maintaining the image proportions. People end up looking short and wide or tall and lanky. Squares become rectangles. Circles become ovals. And the world descends into chaos. So keep your image proportions to keep them looking good. Last one, do put alt text on your images. Don't forget to put alt text on your images. This is so visually impaired users who are using screen reader software know what the picture you're showing is. The folks at Blackboard have put a lot of energy into making the elements compliant for people with disabilities. And I urge you to help promote equitable access to instructional materials even if it's something as small as a picture of a person making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. A few seconds of your time can really go a long way for someone. All right, enough about images. Back to our template. Our next item is the learning objectives. Remember when I said to put all your course objectives in your template? That's because it's way easier to delete the ones you don't need than to add the ones you do. 
It's likely that your course objectives will be addressed in more than one module or that you'll have more than one course objective addressed in one module. This way they're all here and you just remove as needed instead of typing when you need to add them. For the module object objectives, and that missing apostrophe is going to take years off my life. Um, for the module objectives, since these are unique in each module, they'll have to be typed in or pasted from another source. Easy enough. Next is our student directions. Our template gives us a jumping off point, but obviously we want our students doing different things each week, so adapt as needed. For module one, I filled in the placeholders chapter one, assignment number one, and I've also decided that students should watch a video from the Discovery Channel. It's a YouTube video and I'll embed it in this module. Note that I'm using my play icon here. The course links can stay and I'll have the directions for the assignment or the journal and the discussion board activities in those respective areas. So for example, the discussion board, that will just be the instruction text in the discussion board. And just like that, I've adapted my module template to be my first module. Let's look at a before and after. This is my before, my module template, the same one I showed before. And after filling up the content, beautiful. You can see all the things I've added, the intro, the objectives, the student directions, and the new YouTube video is there as well. And that's really it. Continue to copy and adapt your template for each module. Um, if you want, apply date release options to the module folders. That's your call. And when you're done, hide your template by setting it as unavailable to students. You can delete it too if you want, but if there's any possibility that you'll want to come back to it, it's probably best to just hide it. Here's the home area of my four-module course with edit mode on, and you can see I've made the template unavailable and moved it to the bottom. Of course, I still need to build my content and my activities, but the structure of my course is here, and my course is well organized, and it's intuitive for students. One thing I didn't talk about was learning modules, which tend to divide a lot of people, and I'm using a different definition for module here than before. Here I mean the Blackboard function. Uh, learning modules. Some people love them and some people hate them. I think they're great for a certain purpose. If you're delivering content in Blackboard itself that is very text and image heavy in place of a textbook, for example, and your content is linear, learning modules are the way to go. With the setup I've discussed today, nothing really changes in your structure. Your learning module can go within your content folder, but don't include them in your template because each one will change too much and it'll probably be easier to just create a new one each time. And that is it. If you want to reach out to me via email or Twitter, that's how you can find me. I'm happy to take questions now, but feel free to hit me up later, too. Also, if you want those uh, directions icons that I showed before, shoot me an email, and I'll be happy to send them your way. If you have any other questions, that's cool, too.